I'm very grateful to the organizers because the sequence of presentation has been perfect for me in what I'm about to invite us to think about. First of all, a biblical, beautiful biblical theology. Jekyllie, thank you so much. Uh, I had the privilege of ordaining her and uh, it always been something that's warmed my heart. She gave me a Nagaland cloth cape which I took to Rome and had it in the Anglican Centre in Rome for four and a half years and then I brought it back with me. So you've been like a warm uh, cloak around me, Jekyll, and thank you for your scholarship and wisdom this afternoon. Perfect for what I'm going to do. And then Archbishop Don, just exactly what I needed to work with this question this evening. And it occurred to me listening to him that if you take the ideas of Whakapapa and Manakitanga and Whenua and Whanaumatanga, particularly if they have strong synergies with the biblical tradition, which they certainly do, and in terms of the New Testament's understanding of faith community and brotherhood and sisterhood in Christ, you have some very rich material to think about ecclesiology and missiology uh, as Christians from Whakapapa, Whanaumatanga and Whenua. Uh, I think a diocese often behaves like a tribe. And we all know this from, from synods. It's not what you call a rational strategic plan going tickety-boo through absolutely everything in a logical linear sequence in the shortest possible time. It's a wider whānau seeking a measure of consensus about what they value most and what connects them, and what the story tells them from their previous forebears in the faith, and where the story might go. It's, a, it's much more durable, I think, and more uh, creative, and more, uh, more life-giving than a linear strategic plan as such. So I, I've been very helped by the day. What we're going to do is what uh, the TPMC organisers asked us to do, is to think as a group about land as the embodiment of woundedness, and you've seen some of the reason why that might be the case from Jekyllie and Don. But then the point is, therefore, if that's true, it's the Zion tradition, of course, it's many other things to do with uh, the land, the people of God. Reconciliation is the foundation for mission. If we can't offer a measure of reconciliation, then we can't preach it. Our words are vacuous, because our main message is about reconciliation between God and people. And what that cost in prophetic terms, and what that cost in terms of self-giving, and what that means for righteousness and justice. And if we aren't able to attempt the quest for healing of wounds, Reconciliation in, in practice, our uh, preaching becomes, becomes vain. I often tell the story, uh, I had the great privilege of working with some of Mother Teresa's sisters for a while in India, uh, particularly uh, in Pune. She was in Calcutta, but her sisters were in Pune. And when I listened to the talk of the sisters as they brought people um, out of the gutter who were dying, and bathed them and fed them and nursed them and held them until they died or sometimes they recovered or rescued children and brought them up with no income at all for themselves moving through all the caste laws Brahmin sisters working with Harajan sisters and Harajan people restoring the dignity in the name of the kingdom of God reconciliation uh, in practical, nitty-gritty terms. I tried to think about what the sisters used to say about their faith. And I remember thinking, listening to them in the chapel or talking to them over a cup of tea, I remember thinking, what you're telling me is what I learned in Sunday school. And it was as simple as that. I see Jesus in them. Or... Acts chapter 4, we're meant to hold things in common. Or weep with those who weep. Um, it wasn't new. 
and it was really simple. But what got me, and which has captured the imagination of Malcolm Muggeridge, the great atheist cynic who later converted, partly because he saw this happen, is that they walk their talk. If you see these simple phrases walking, something happens about the credibility of a gospel mission of reconciliation. And this is true of the relationship between land, wealth, and power. It's a don't tell me, show me opportunity. And I can tell you, uh, even from something that happened this morning, how powerful that is. I'll get to that in a minute. So let's go to something we know well. And uh, we're getting in touch with the issues of land, reconciliation, wealth, and power right here. And we are in the middle of the picture with Henry Williams. Uh, he gave this document over land, money, power, an incredible meaning when he deliberately took two words from Luke's Gospel and put them in here. Rangatiretanga, meaning chiefly rule, and kawanatanga, meaning governance or government. They're both in Luke. And Luke was the main text that the Maori Christian missions were reading. So when he put in 1840, the chiefs will retain their rangatiratanga, their chiefly rule. The chief said to him, we know what you mean. Many of them had been mission participants. But what we want is something more. We want you, Henry, to put in the word tino before the word rangatiratanga, so there's no confusion. And Henry did. He started off with rangatiratanga, and he put in tino rangatiratanga, to avoid any confusion. This is not like a farmer owning property and doing what they like on the property. This is absolute tino rangatiratanga, chiefly rule. And when he used that word, and they read the word, they immediately thought of te rangatiratanga o te rangi, or te, rang te rangatiratanga o te atua, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And that's absolute, chiefly rule. They wouldn't have signed this document if he had just put, you can keep your lands, but the British will tell you how to run the farm. They weren't agreeing to that. And secondly, he put in kawanatanga, which is what? And this is the interesting part, as Chief Justice, or Justice Joe Williams said two weeks ago in Tauranga. Kawanatanga is Pontius Pilate. He's the governor of a territory which has within it a kingdom, the kingdom of Herod. And Just Justice Williams said to a large Māori audience in Tauranga that I attended the other day, um, we got kingdom, you got Pontius Pilate. It's just a little land claim joke. But what it means is that Kāwanatanga, which is on the right here, provides a template, a series of structures for governance across a land. Fair go principles over land sales and purchase. Fair go principles over justice. Pan Aotearoa. Fair go means of ending a war internally. Fair go means of all the rights of citizenship in government. So it's a mutual sovereignty. It's a balance of partnership, participation, and protection expressed in rangatiratanga and equity. That's what Henry was thinking. And as we know, the United Nations have agreed that a covenant partnership document between two parties where one of the parties is the indigenous owner of the land and the other party is an incoming colonial 
opportunist or a rival, the document has to be understood in terms of the language of the people it's being offered to. If I do a deal with you in French, because you're French, you will go by what the French says, not by what I think I have written down. I, I need to know what it says in French, and I need to agree to what it says in French if I'm the treating party. And the recipient party who agrees to sign knows what it means in French. Governance and chiefly rule. So what we've got is this. Let me give these out. There is one uh, narrative I've heard that Henry wanted to put in the word mana and the mission uh, participant chief said no, we want rangatiratanga and we want tino rangatiratanga. Uh, just an interesting back story there for, for us. If there's any spare I'll take one. Oh, thank you. There's plenty coming. So I think there's about three more than are here, so there's one. If you look at your sheet, you have the Māori version. Uh, there's, there's a typo. In all my documents, there's one typo. And this is in the Māori on the first line of the first paragraph. Ko na rangatira o te waka meaninga, not of, but the other, the rest of the Māori is correct. So, this is the Māori version. And if you go down to the bottom of the page, Professor Hugh Kafaru, an Anglican, uh, I think from Ngāti Whātua, I think possibly Orake, but, um, uh, and a member of a general synod at one point, translated it this way at the bottom of the page. Just have a quick read of that. And over the next page, and you can see from the second paragraph in Māori, it's actually also mostly true in English version, that you may not take away my language, or my land, or my treasures, or my chiefly rule without my permission. You may not invade. You may not do shonky deals. You may not outmaneuver. You may not treat with the wrong party or a child. You will treat with me. And all those things I've just said occurred, as we know, as the treaty was broken and breached and eventually trampled on. I won't go through the rest of the pages because they're just for your uh, reading later, but they make the point about Luke's Gospel. What I will read out is Claudia Orange's view of what he thought he was doing in this picture. And there it is on the second inside page, in italics, middle of the page. More generally, missionary influence was significant simply because many Māori trusted the missionary's good intentions. This appears to have added a religious aspect to Māori understanding of the agreement. At Waitangi, Henry Williams was responsible for developing the idea that Māori and Pākehā could be one people in both a spiritual and temporal sense. The treaty therefore could be construed as a covenant between the Māori people and the Queen as head of the English church and state, a concept that had its parallel in Māori society, where a chief might also hold the rank of and then this, this 
paragraph that gets me every time, other aspects of the covenant analogy might have encouraged its use. Hecke, for example, spoke of the treaty as the new covenant, as Christ was the new covenant and as of the old Mosaic law was put aside on conversion to Christianity. So the treaty, with its promise of a new relationship between the crown and the Māori chiefs, could be likened to the new covenant. The idea had been echoed at Kaitaia, and this is the line that gets me. When one young chief, this would be missionary participant chief, expressed the hope, looking straight at Hobson, if your British thoughts are towards Christ, as ours are, we shall be one. So the treaty works if it's got a faith base, which means faith, hope and love, which means justice and righteousness, which means good faith, good love, good hope. That's the only way it will work. And the Anglican Church in Aotearoa, New Zealand and Polynesia decided to clean up its own backyard and reorganise itself to try and show and tell what this would look like in good faith, hope and love by its 1990 and 1992 constitution. We wouldn't be able to say anything about Māori wards today or Māori seats today or MMP uh, with the implications of um, Māori political representation unless we had done something about it ourselves because we were there. And this is what we thought we were doing. If you flip over to the back page, I've adapted what was uh, a widely used diagram from 30 years ago in anti-racism workshops and indeed Te Kaupapa Tikanga Rua workshops of this church for over a decade. Just have a look at that. The Declaration of Independence was first mooted in 1831. It was signed in 1835. Through the Manuhiritanga of Tikanga Māori, which you see in the top circle, then enveloping Pākehā arrival in the second circle, and then a good faith Waitangi covenant in the third level, then the betrayal and neglect of the treaty when good faith collapsed, and the process of colonisation and integration, then Māori Manamotu Hake self-determination efforts, which needed to be assertive and to some extent disruptive, in order to get to the bottom arrangement, which was the idea we had here in 1840. And we are seeing glimmers of this coming through now. Ratification, participation, protection, uh, through the Waitangi Tribunal, but also through many efforts of the Church. What I'd like to do is just briefly uh, refer to you, just for a few minutes, and then I'll take us on a walk through what's happening at the moment in terms of reconciliation using this uh, ecclesiology, this missiology, this theology of land. First of all, you. In Tikunapaka, in the New Zealand Diocese, this kind of faith position is taken seriously, in my view, and has been worked on by dioceses as carefully and gradually uh, as you can. We have a long way to go, of course, we, we do. But we are on this pathway, and this is our vision and mandate from there. Let's start at the, uh, the bottom of our uh, New Zealand diocesan arrangement in Dunedin, or Te uh, when Anne and I and others were negotiating about whether to keep Selwyn College as part of the Diocese of Dunedin, which they agreed to do, uh, and not to sell it, one of the considerations, amongst many others, was the need to uphold a Tikonga scholarship student 
reality in the college if they could, and if they wanted to remain part of this. And that had a particular emphasis on te wai paunamu and ngā mana whenua o Otipoti. So what would it mean, for example, if Selwyn College reimagines itself in the future, now that it's decided to stay and has been decided to be kept by the Anglican Farno with its whakapapa, manaakitonga and whenua, for a more three tikanga expression in its life. And Bishop Richard, Bishop of Te Waipanamo, said this to the Otago, to the Dunedin Synod. This is being taken seriously in Dunedin and will be enacted before September, one way or another. Moving to uh, Ōtautahi, to Christchurch, the foundation of Te Wai Pounamu, before the 1990 constitution, uh, of a school for girls, Māori girls in Te Wai Pounamu, was uh, a major mission of the Diocese of Christchurch. They have also since returned to church at Arafenua, to Tikunga Māori, and are contemplating another one of those. They know they've got a lot a long way to go about resourcing, about um, whenua in the, in the resourcing sense. But they're working on it, they're taking it seriously. Nelson, one of the first peak on the Pākehā dioceses to work on this, returned the Whakarewa land uh, some years ago now. Uh, and we know that Bishop Suter of Nelson, the second Bishop of Nelson, was the only peak on the Pākehā bishop of his day to object to the invasion and dispossession in Taranaki. He put himself on the line and was pilloried in the settler press for saying this. But he was driven by a Clapham sect evangelical vision, a then CMS vision of holistic mission and justice. And he just said in the press again and again after the invasion of Taranaki, this is wrong. This is greed. This is immoral. This is against my faith, my hope and my love. And thank God he said that. In Wellington, they're taking seriously now and have been for some time the infamous or famous case of Weeparata and the Bishop of Wellington. And Bishop Justin is seeking to reverse that exact uh, indictment on the Treaty of Waitangi by negotiating with Ngāti Tua as we speak uh, on what it would mean to turn the tables on that unfortunate declaration of nullity of this document. And a Bishop of Wellington is working on that exact issue right now. Uh, when you move further north to Waiapu, uh, you've got a long history of very, very early seminal relationships, which Bishop Don uh, alluded to. But Bishop Andrew is working extremely hard to put front and centre restorative justice for Tauranga and the CMS mission land loss held in faith as Mabel's vineyard and to put it in front of the synod and in front of the standing committee and in front of the putia where resources are allocated. Uh, in the Diocese of Waikato and Taranaki, Archbishop Philip is working very hard indeed to to tell a new story in Taranaki with bricks and mortar and manaakitanga and whakapapa. And almost miraculous transformation of relationships has occurred there. The same thing is just about to happen and is happening in Ngāti Maniapoto, Ngāti Haua uh, and Ngāti Wairere here in this area. You move to Auckland and look at the early relationship that Waiaho Te Hara had with the Bishop of Auckland and the founding of Vaughan Park as a Te Kaupapa Tikangarua enterprise, but also their current work on Ngāti Whātua on returning the whenua in the broadest sense to mana whenua at Orake by a treaty-like negotiation, by thinking this was the way to go ending up at the bottom of the page, where not only is land or putea or whenua returned, which they have achieved and are working on, but a win-win mutual relationship might be furthered, and both sides are interested in that. I hope I haven't left a diocese out. I don't think I have. What I'm offering you is best practice that can be a springboard into what I'm going to say now and to what might encourage us as we move forward. So there's the, the reading you've just had. Uh, absolutely crucial. Treat it as seriously as a covenant. 
covenants are expressed through rainbows uh, in the Old Testament. And this is a rainbow over Napier. Uh, when we look up and see this bow in the sky, we think of the relationship and reconciliation between God and people in Christ through his life, wisdom, crucifixion and resurrection. But we also think of what implications that has for the houses and the foreshore and seabed, which we know is all around us. This is not far from the cathedral in Napier. Let me get local for a few minutes. We do Tommy Hanna in our prayer book, got a day for him, Tara Pipipi Waharoa, the paramount chief of Ngāti Hauwa. He, probably above anybody else in the 19th century, took the book of Deuteronomy and the Sermon on the Mount to the max. And basically what he said was, I want to follow Christ in righteousness and justice with the land, with Manakitanga, with partnership, and with win-win opportunities. And as you know, he invited a group of local settler, Pākehā people, to live with his own people at Tāpuri, near Matamata at Waharoa, and later at Peria, creating a model Christian village where the bell would ring for church prayers at six in the morning and everybody would go for Karakia Mihenare, Anglican missionary prayers. And visitors to these villages at Tāpuri and Peria said they had never seen the like of a Christian use of land, resources, horticulture, agriculture, and communal life. It was Acts 4, literally in the very soil. And he thought that would work as a parable and a model for our terror. It did for a while, and it began to influence a lot of people. But the New Zealand Land Company, the East India Land Company, greed uh, from merchants, many of whom never came here. The New Zealand Land Company was London-based and largely never left London, but sent agents to this country to acquire land or grab land or to even steal land at times, which was a clear breach of the covenant at Waitangi. And he tried to negotiate peaceful resistance for a season, which collapsed, and then he felt he had no choice but to draw a line in the sand. And so he stood with his people at Rangiriri, where the Māori king had said, I don't want to fight you. I'm not going to attack Auckland. Some people have said I will, but I won't. But if you cross the Mangatāwhiri stream, you're coming onto my land and my capacity for manakitanga, my iwi, my hapu, my whānau, we will disintegrate under your pressure, your numbers, and your ambitions. This is not your land. And the treaty said it wasn't their land. The CMS said it wasn't their land. But they crossed the Mangatāwhiri stream, so he joined the defences at Rangiriri, he joined other skirmishes for over two years, and then saw the whole thing was going to end in utter massacre and bloodbath and negotiated a armed truce and a peace at Tamahere, not far from here. It was not a surrender. He put down his taiaha first in front of Lieutenant Colonel Carey and said, let there be peace between us, provided you don't take any more land or return the land that you have taken, which... They didn't. He spent the rest of his life trying to litigate an honouring of these principles by seeking the return of the land. They only settled with the Crown about eight years ago. He lived in these places that I've described. He's probably the greatest prophet of the 19th century alongside Tafiti. Here is his direct descendant on the left. Great, 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 great grandson, Anuru Tamihana, known to the bishops, and to Hahi Nehenare. He became confirmed as an Anglican. He was married by Canon Wita Tohuata, 
given the Gospel of Luke in Maori. From this, he showed me that Gospel from his wedding day the other day. His grandson has been on the ha, uh, Hahi Mihinare Trust Board, Anglican Action. They take the relationship with us extremely seriously and we are in partnership with them on a riparian planting scheme to cleanse the waterways of the Piako area in partnership with dairy farmers on the Ngāti Hauwa Mahi Trust, won a Biotech Award for doing that. The partnership goes on, the mission goes on, it's about land. It's about clean waterways, it's about partnership with Pākehā and Māori, using the bottom of the page as the paradigm. Rangi Ōwhia, you know the tragedy of the, uh, the battle there. 1852, 3, 4, saw these two churches built. The oldest building still standing in Waikato today. The gardens around these churches, particularly at Rangi Ōwhia in the top right, were so big they were feeding Auckland. They were trading with Sydney, they were trading with California. They would, but for the invasion and land war, incursion, still be the North Island's biggest fruit and veg merchants. With CMS ploughs, CMS technology, and CMS support. But the invasion confiscated all of this. The Battle of Rangiriri, the first incursion, the fight at Rangiopia, uh, arguably one of our worst disasters and tragedies where General Cameron, who was going to attack the main Rewi Maniapoto Pa at Patarangi, saw it was impossible to take. So well trenched, so well palisaded, so well manned, he decided at night to sneak through a swamp area with his bayonets covered with cloth so they didn't glisten in the moonlight. 17 kilometers at night to attack on the 21st of February, 1864, the peaceful garden Anglican Catholic mission village of Rangiafia, where there were about six rifles. A number of women and children and elderly men died in the burning Ropor church and it's regarded now as a war crime. Just this morning, this morning, their descendants, who survived, spoke with the vicar of Te Aramutu about the possibility of putting a whare taonga, their own museum, the only building they've ever had since dispossession and disbursement in 1864, next to the old church of St. John at Te Aramutu. What would it mean if they had their treasure house next to the old church, which was built long before the New Zealand wars? And what would happen if we did this again? They want to do it. The Catholic cemetery with a poet to the people who died in the flames at Rangiopia. The Battle of Orako, uh, famous Rewi's last stand, Rewi Munga Maniapoto, uh, 360 Māori faced with four times the amount of British or colonial troops with cannons and guns. The colonial troops say to Rewi, why don't you end this and surrender? And he says, no, we will continue to defend our land. And then the Officer in charge says to the Māori defendants, well, at least let the women and children come out. And Ahumai Te Paivata said, we will fight with our men and we will never give up, forever and ever and ever. Ake, 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 which became the catch fly of the Māori battalion in World War II. That's her, Ahumai Te Paivata. I spoke to her great, great, great grandson the other day. And he was talking about this. A British officer who was in the attack on Orako, when the women, children and old men and the warriors suddenly burst out of the power, got through the British lines to some extent into the 
swamp and then out. Half of them were killed, but half got out. She survived with four bullet wounds. Her thumb was blown off, uh, badly wounded in the leg, and two other places. She came across one of the officers who attacked the battle scene at Horako a year later, Gilbert Mayer, and he was captured by members of Ngāti Maniapoto in, on the edge of the Kin country near Kihiki, and they were doing a karakia, which would have been followed by his execution, military execution. And she, hobbling with her wound, thumb blown off, used her korowai, you can see here, stopped the karakia, put her korowai around his shoulders, and led him away to safety. She was thinking of this. Riwi Mangamaniapoto himself, the Anglican Church has been involved in the return of his korowai from 1878, just before he negotiated with the British to end the guerrilla warfare and the hostilities, which had gone on for over 12 years after the Battle of Orako. He used his korowai, you can see the colour version of the Tainuku border, to give to his neighbour, a Pākehā neighbour, an Anglican, Mr Grice, as a sign he wanted to trade again and do this again and start again. His great, great, great grandson, the, Mr Grice's grandson, is now treating with us, the Anglicans, as an Anglican deal, to return the Korowai, the Kaitaka. It'll be here by October. New Zealand's, one of New Zealand's most significant peace symbols. It'll do a tour for a year and then be housed by a museum. Tauranga, uh, you're familiar with that story in the Diocese of Waiapu, Otamataha Trust, now today, but the CMS owned lands all around this old pa. This is by Mr. Kinder, of Kinder Library fame, an etching before the Battle of Gay Pa in 1864, showing the pa clearly at that Otamataha area, Mount Mangunui, Mawao in the background. CMS had um, huge tracts of land which they wanted to keep for posterity, for uh, Christian uh, goodwill community, not like Russell had been. Uh, the hellhole of the Pacific, they wanted an alternative Christian Maori society, bought all the land, 1,300 acres from here to Gate Pa all taken after the Battle of Gate Pa here by the Crown, except for the mission lands, which they couldn't take. Then they forced the CMS eventually, after many protests, saying it was Nabos Vineyard in one and two kings and could not be taken, it was held in trust. The Crown forced uh, the relinquishment of the land because CMS believed it would be requisitioned. Where currently in process, and the Bishop of Waiapu and his diocese acting, I think, heroically and generously with others to offer restorative justice for this vision. Heni Te Kirikaramu Gate Pa, the heroine who gave water to the British soldiers who were dying, Henari Wurima Taratoa, St John's College, Anglican Ordinand, Defending the power at Gate Power from invasion and dispossession dies later at Teranga, having given Christian based principles for a Geneva type convention in the fight. Today, Te Karufa, named after Williams with his two eyeglasses and therefore two eyes, so it's Tahi Rua, two glasses, Tahi Rua, two eyes, that's four, Karufa, four eyes, they called him four eyes in 1840. This group, Te Karufa now, working out a Williams approach to Treaty Covenant Restorative Justice, Alistair Rees, the author of the Restorative Justice Package for Tauranga. Archbishop Philip Richardson, uh, moved by the Holy Spirit to kneel in the wet grass in front of Otamataha, giving the Anglican apology in Māori and English. He said to me, I thought someone might have pushed me down, but none of us touched him. He just felt this enormous pressure to sink into the grass on his knees. And I can tell you in the seconds that followed, we were all weeping. That's opened a whole new relationship with Ngati Tapu and Ngai Tamarawaho in Taranga. Taranaki, 
Parihaka, Tafiti the prophet, Tohu the prophet, and now some of their Tatiawa descendants working with St Mary's Pro Cathedral, Bishop Philip and Taranaki, to create in that old colonial graveyard area with Tiki Ramati in there as well now, uh, a Justice and Peace Reconciliation Centre, Te Whare Honunga, in the memory of Paul Reeves, but in the spirit of Te Whiti and Tohu. Without these concrete, um, explicit expressions of covenantal theology, our words are useless and we will get nowhere. But with something in the ground, with a stake in the ground, quite literally, I could see a new age of bicultural mission and multicultural mission emerging from this form of justice making. Uh, I'll close by saying, you know the psalmist says, I will not listen to your prayers until there is justice at the gate. That is a measure of justice in a fallen world, a measure of justice. And that's what I encourage you to build on and to think through. I'll stop now and we can have a short plenary. Questions, comments uh, as we go. Or responses of any kind. You might want to name something you're thinking of doing or something that needs to be done and hasn't been done or just amusing theologically about land and reconciliation. Yes. The words of the young chief yes. from Kaitaia at Waitangi in 1840, yes. he said to Hobson that he meant the crown, if your British thoughts are towards Christ as ours are, we shall be one. So this only works with faith, hope and love. It, it won't work with secular, um, primitive market capitalism. It will only work through Whanaungatanga, Manakitanga, and Te Romo Pai. Bishop, um, a couple of weeks ago, I met a, a really interesting person called Sini Ruakere. She's a friend of Jerry Rukas. She was down in the Kaiba to do a combined church this um, weekend. We had a couple, she and I, some friends, uh, talking about this. And, and she said, she says, the company. She says a covenant aligned to a marriage covenant that it's that intention, that is the, the spirit behind the more than detail. But, but she was saying that for her and others, it's, it's, it's that sacred. Yes. It was certainly seen by the missionaries and the Māori who signed as sacred. You know that the first morning when they gathered to sign, there was a debate. And Bishop Pompelier, who's French, Catholic, said to them, be careful about this, I don't know that this will be upheld. He, of course, might have preferred a French arrival. I don't know. Uh, but he said that, and other chiefs said, I'm not sure about this at all. I think we'll end up dispossessed. I, can't, I don't trust this. But it was the mission participant chiefs who won the day with speeches like the Kaitaia Rangatira. They persuaded the majority of Māori chiefs to sign. It was a Christian happening, which is why we are right in the middle of it, as a matter of good faith. I, I, such a, a hard history, a painful history to delve into, and so deeply ingrained in Pākehā. DNA and, and some work I'm doing at the moment. I find it fascinating that even so great a figure as Selby arrives down in you know our territory, uh, seeing himself and with some reluctance Watkins as you know the bringers of the gospel. Yes. When Tamahani Tarapraha and Tefefi had been there long before. And for the Wesleyans. Yeah. Yeah. And they're not named. They're this invisible force mm -hmm. that I just begrudgingly 
at the most acknowledges that they may have been there. So there, there was this invisible gospel that yes. just wasn't acknowledged. Yes, and mentioning Selwyn, of course, you're probably aware that he rode behind the colonial forces crossing the Mangatafiri stream with the purpose of building a field hospital for both sides at Te Aumutu. And that was seen, perhaps understandably, as chaplaincy to the invader. Uh, that wasn't what he thought he was doing. Uh, and at Te Aumutu or Taufau, his hospital was for both sides. And he actually protected several tamatoa from being bayoneted by colonial troops by putting himself between the bayonet and the patient. But, and Vincent O'Malley says he rode with those who came into Rangiofia, which Alan Davidson has proved is not true. Alan Davidson's redemption of Selwyn at Rangiofia is quite important because otherwise he's the bishop who burnt their children. And that's not true. Uh, but his role was ambiguous. Half the army were Anglican, the Māori missions were Anglican, and he wanted to try to be a pastor to both sides, and of course he was crucified in the middle. When he uh, went back to Litchfield, Bishop of Litchfield, as he was dying, the last words he said to his wife, she survived him by many years, were in Māori. As he was dying, he croaked out, do you think they will come back? He was broken hearted by what happened to the Mihinari mission after the land wars and the gospel survived. Um, it dispersed in so many different ways across denominations. There's a cross on top of the King Tonga coat of arms. Ngāti Hauwa insist on a gospel-based karakia. Ngāti Apakura had a hui on Saturday. I went to it. There was Christian karakia all the way through. Ngāti Wairere at St Paul's Collegiate two days ago, full-on respect for the gospel. It survived. Our institution had major credibility wobbles uh, because this fell to the ground, but it's standing back up again, in my view. Thank you for, for the um, countrywide, really, Aotearoa Guai, to you painted, of some of the initiatives in each diocese, and I've been really inspired by it. How do you see, or what do you see, will be the impacts on the worshipping life? of the church as we move more into a genuine partnership. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of places where already, um, for example, the, the initiative in Tawamutu or in New Plymouth, uh, where the land and the buildings are actually coming closer to the uh, What are your hopes or your, what are you seeing in the horizon? in terms of our worshiping life? Well, that's part of the answer to Bishop, Archbishop Don's question. Um, all these things I've been describing are settling with injustices over land with the tribes. Uh, but our marriage with Tikunga Māori in our church is our core, is our centre. And it is, it looks like this. So I personally think we will thrive, not just survive, if we find within the Anglican Church more appropriate win-win partnership opportunities. Now that won't mean blending and merging like a puree. It will mean the Cody uh, and the Oak or whatever not standing in each other's shadow, but maybe their branches will reach out and touch. And that could be any number of things. That could be uh, God willing, the Te to example. It could mean um, sharing resources as they do at Vaughan Park. It could mean any local, appropriate, mutually supportive actions. Obviously money, land, buildings, but maybe with their own mana, but clearly needing each other. One, what would that look like? Joe Williams said, uh, just this meeting two weeks ago in Tauranga, where he was very positive about the Diocese of Waiapu, by the way. Uh, he said, this covenant 
means that we are better together than we would be if we were alone. But it's not two circles blending so they lose the red and the blue. It's two circles retaining their colour and their space, but negotiating the common areas. And if our parish is started to look like that, this cathedral, through the leadership of Dean Wendy, uh, has conceptualised the idea of a King Itana Chapel for the Māori King in the cathedral. It's a concept at the moment. It's on the wall behind you. But if that happened, that would be literally this, in a building, with its own Māori po whenua entrance, with its own mana and ihi and wihi. Um, it's a remarkable thing to think. Uh, more of that. More of that. And complete access for them at any time under any... Returning land, returning buildings where it's appropriate. I personally think there's a strong case for land and buildings going back wherever possible, maybe with some partnership agreements. Because you don't want to give back land and buildings with no budget for maintenance. Maybe you could be involved as a maintenance budget participant and share karakia when appropriate, uh, like this. We don't want to absorb Māori energy and divert and exhaust Māori energy because we need partnership. We've got to find a way that both of us thrive um, Given the hour, that may be enough, I think. Uh, thank you.